welcome to the soft matter show this is amal narayanan i am a chemist and a polymer scientist in this podcast we will talk about soft matter science and have fireside chats with the researchers please enjoy the show this episode is a conversation with dr james egan on plastic recycling and academic research we discussed his motivations to become a scientist and taking up research challenges the research problem james specializes is a million dollar plastic recycling yes i'm sure that you must be thinking that the plastic recycling research is a notorious challenge and needed to be solved immediately indeed i'm here to tell you that James's approach that combines synthetic chemistry and engineering to resolve some of the outstanding problems in recycling is unique and exciting. As you'll find from this conversation that his passion and knowledge in the field of recycling is extraordinary. And let's learn how his team attempts to resolve the plastic pollution. Today we have Dr. James Egan online. He is an assistant professor at the School of Polymer Science and Polymer Engineering. at the University of Akron since 2019. James has a diverse career por- portfolio. Prior to joining the University of Akron, James shared his experience at Aramco Performance Materials and Ascribe Bioscience. He was awarded the Newcomb Cleveland Prize in 2017 and is a visionary of the U Akron team that granted $2 million from DOE. So without further ado, Let's hear from James. Welcome, James. Thanks, Amal. Yeah. Glad to be here. Thank you. So, like, I want to ask you the, the first thing to be, is that the first question I would like to ask you is that, what did, what did you want it to be when you were growing up? Did you, did you want it, always want it to be a scientist? I didn't know that I wanted to be a scientist, yes. But from a very early age, I did not enjoy literature or the english courses that we were required to take in primary school mm-hmm. um always loved scientists i loved the absolutism of science where okay. you were very confident that yes this how, is the answer how, how did you get like how did you know growing up that there's a profession called scientist exists is it from the tv or do you have anyone who influenced you in that case good i'm not really sure where s- the idea of being a scientist came from mm-hmm. my parents are my dad's an engineer mm-hmm. my mom's so they're leaning towards the sciences but um my sister and i both actually ended up getting phd's in sciences she has a phd in psychology and myself in chemistry so clearly wow. something <laughs> us that way yeah so you are you have you have been exposed to some of the science part growing up if if, if i'm saying it right is that true absolutely yeah Uh, we we have a TV show growing mm-hmm. up Bill Nye the Science Guy. I mm-hmm. I definitely remember that from a, a young age. Uh-huh. Um actually getting to meet him when mm-hmm. he visited oh, wow. one. So this was when you were wh- where was this like uh, which place of US was this? Uh so I met him in graduate school. He oh. gave a talk. Um but we would watch those videos mm-hmm. and TV from him uh in just about every science class growing up in the mm-hmm. US. You watched an episode of Bill Nye. All right, that sounds good. So you were influenced by the TV as well. <laughs> so so now let's get to the topic and like you know major part of our discussion. So one thing I want to cover today is that about your exciting research platform that you have put together at the University of Akron in terms of plastic recycling. So what are the, some of the most exciting things that you are currently working on? Sure. So I think some of the most exciting data that we are currently generating is related both to plastics recycling mm-hmm. and coming up with ways of enhancing the performance of recycled materials. Mm-hmm. We have a lot of infrastructure in the United States mm-hmm. and across the world to recycle. The problem is is the mechanical properties are just too poor. Mm-hmm. Um, and so if you can increase those mechanical properties to something that would be competitive with virgin resins that's how we're going to solve this problem is creating an economic incentive so you mean you you plan to create new polymers which will have equivalent or better p- performance than the currently commercially available material polymers you mean 
So not entirely. Mm -hmm. I, I'm of the opinion that we will not invent new polymers. Okay. <laughs> if used polyethylene and polypropylene, we're closing in on 100 years uh, since the discovery of polyethylene. Mm -hmm. And, and um, it's not going to just get replaced mm -hmm. anytime. And so it's critical that we develop solutions to the materials that we have. Mm -hmm. I'm a synthetic chemist. I think about making new materials. I love the idea of new materials, yet I just said we're never going to make a new material. So what I mean by that and what drives our group is mm -hmm. you can make a new additive. You can make something that you might use in 1%, mm -hmm. 2%, and add that to existing materials. Mm -hmm. And if you can just sprinkle in a little bit of essentially pixie dust and transfer those properties, that is where the opportunity exists. So that it will becomes reusable. Is that what you mean? So the way it would work is you would spill in a small amount of this additive mm -hmm. in existing recycling feed, and suddenly the mechanical properties would transform into something useful. Okay, so that means like you start with the polymer, which is already used, and it does not have the effective mechanical properties that it needs to be used again. So you would put some polymer in it or some material in it to make it like the original material. Is that what you mean? Exactly. Okay, perfect. Yeah, I heard your recent talk, so I'm trying to connect the dots right, uh, here right now. So uh, that's that's exciting. So where, like, uh, what, is a, what is the biggest problem that you think is about the plastic recycling? Like how, how much is it going to influence the current lifestyle of people? There's a lot of problems. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> it's very hard to say this is the major problem. Mm -hmm. And it's difficult because this is a societal problem. Mm -hmm. As scientists and engineers in our school, we want to think of the technical solutions. And there are technical solutions. Some of those are related to compatibilizers. Some of them are related to robotics and sorting. Others are related to machine learning. But then there are behavioral problems. Mm -hmm. The citizens cannot put our plastic waste into a bag to throw it away. Putting it in a bag is the worst thing you can do. You need to keep them loose. Trying to over recycle this, I, I call it wish cycling. You know, oh, I, this this plastic container is probably clean enough to recycle, right? You throw it in your bin, and it ends up causing more problems than good. Okay. So there's behavioral issues, and then there's economic issues. What are the businesses that are going to sell these products? Mm -hmm. you know, I I, re I showed that slide in my talk recently, but I'll recap it here. Mm -hmm. Where at the beginning of the pandemic, we when we were running out of paper towels and toilet paper, there was still ample supply of the recycled paper products because the properties suck and nobody wants to buy them. And so there's no economic incentive to recycle either. So all of those feed together to create this massive systemic issue. Um, and I can't identify one single issue that is the primary one. I can only say, I think I know how to solve this part of the problem mm -hmm. and then work towards that. So can you explain a little bit more on the um, on the AI side of it? Like, I think there's a lot of interest in that area or in terms of the robotics of plastic recycling and AI. So can you, would you care to explain a little bit more that, more about that? Sure. So this is not my area of expertise, mm. but as far as I understand, um, if you look at a recycling plant, mm. there are workers. There are workers who have to go in and, unclog machines. There are pieces that need to be sorted manually because primarily the method of sorting in, a, in the U.S. right now is an optical sorter. You can also use flotation uh, as well. And so if it's not doesn't differ by density or if it's optically difficult to sort, either because the color um, is interfering or the chemical structures are too similar, you can't tell them apart, um, you really need to have uh, someone on the ground able to make the decision, is this recyclable or not? And so AI and machine learning come into play because you can replace those people. And whenever you replace 
people, you can do it cheaper, you can do it faster. And so, and safer for that matter. A lot of times these machines are, you know, they're giant gears that are turning. And when they get clogged, you'd have to go and climb up into the gears manually, pull out these plastic bags and other ropes that are tying up the machines. And that's really dangerous. Mm -hmm. So it's really important that we have machines and the ability to sort out these problematic materials. And so machine learning and AI are really making advances in object recognition and in object handling, being able to grasp something, tell, ah, oh, it's this stiff, therefore it must be polystyrene or polypropylene. It's this shape, that must be a rope or that must be a bottle cap. Let me grab that out of there. Wow, that, that, that's exciting. That's a, that's a very cool thing to do, I think. Like if, if we can make the plastic recycling in terms of the process also better, rather than the chemistry that that also sounds good so it, it should be a collective effect that's what i feel to to start to get get to the place that we want to go so i want to switch switch the gears a little bit and then ask you about your recent award like so i i read that you recently received it with the team dr junpeng wang that you got around the two millions from doe would you like to would you like to explain um, about what like a little bit of uh flavor on the of the proposal that you have written sure so this project is heavily focused on um, carbon fiber reinforced plastics mm -hmm. and so these materials are really vital to sustainable solutions so for example your car contains carbon fiber reinforced plastics airplanes do wind turbines contain these materials And what is unique about them is they have extremely high specific tensile strength. What that means is how strong something is versus how much it weighs, right? We can make things out of steel that are really strong, but steel's really heavy. So you can make a steel car. We obviously do. You make steel airplanes, but then they're extremely heavy. So you have to burn more fuel in order to then move said uh, transportation. So carbon fiber reinforced plastics are just as strong, but they're a lot lighter. This allows you to then burn less energy, um, and fuel and fossil fuels and all these things. And so it, there's a sustainability aspect. Um, we call this light weighting, the, the transportation. So light weighting is a very important objective for reducing um, our fossil fuel consumption as a society. The problem with existing carbon fiber reinforced plastics, though, is that they are completely non-recyclable. And so essentially the way it works is you make these materials by putting in carbon fibers, which are you know, very strong threads, essentially. So what kind of plastics are used uh, in this in this context? Yeah, and so traditionally we use epoxies. And uh -huh. so these are an all A epoxies um, to be very specific. And so they're thermosets. And what you end up having is now this matrix of the epoxy, and then you have these reinforcing components of the carbon fiber. Mm -hmm. Lightweight plastic, but strong because of the carbon fiber. It's kind of like paper mache, if you've ever done paper mache, where you have the mache matrix and then the paper is kind of like the thread. However, like I was saying, um, you can't recycle these. You can't recycle these in all sorts of ways. You can't molt, um, melt up. Uh, melt them, remold them. You can't chemically recycle them. And so one of the major challenges here is how do you both mechanically recycle them so that you can melt them and use them in existing manufacturing methods? But there's another very important aspect to this, which is how do we recover the carbon fiber? You know, carbon fiber is a very advanced technology. It takes a lot of energy to carbonize and make those materials. And so we put about 10 times as much energy into the carbon fiber as we do the plastic. So if you had to pick what am I going to recover, you need to get the fiber back. So existing methods for recovering the fiber oftentimes involve really high temperatures or mechanical grinding. And when you do that, you end up damaging the fiber. Uh, it'll break, it'll get shorter, and it um, essentially decreases the performance of these fibers. So when we finish with current airplanes or when we finish with existing wind turbines, we just bury them in the desert. There's a 
entire desert out, I think it's in Arizona or New Mexico, that is just a wind turbine airplane junkyard. And we've just buried all this carbon fiber reinforced plastic. So the technology we're proposing is a material that you can melt and remold, but it still has the performance of a thermoset like, um, like epoxy resin, but it's also chemically recyclable, meaning you can unzip it, depolymerize the plastic. And what that's going to do is it's going to make the carbon fiber recovery very easy. And so we're going to be able to hopefully recover the carbon fibers of um, near identical performance uh, without shortening them or destroying them. And then the boot, um, the plastics are made from sustainable sources. And so it's not that we've only achieved recyclability, but we're also making these from um, molecules like carbon dioxide or ethylene oxide or soybean oil. And so we're able to source these from renewable sources as well. So ultimately, you are trying to create a, um, a thermoset itself. So it will still be a thermoset. Is that what you mean? So the the technical term for these kinds of materials are vitrimers. And okay, so these are... Okay, yeah, I am. So vitrimers are um, thermosets that... Um, they're cross-linked materials that are essentially thermoplastics. When you heat them up, their bonds that cause them to be cross-linked are dynamic. And so they can exchange um, through a variety of different mechanisms in order to maintain that processability and the flow um, that is required for conventional processing, like injection molding. Oh, that's that's very exciting. I think Vitremers is a very rapidly growing field right now. So if I'm recollecting it right, so it is like you have a you have some dynamically exchanging bond, which is always breaking or forming and you have a catalyst also in it. Is that what it is? That is a very um, accurate description of some vitrimers. Okay. Catalysts so, are not always required, mm -hmm. and so there's a lot of effort to try and not require a catalyst. Mm -hmm. And the dynamic bonds are not always exchanging. Mm -hmm. They only exchange above the vitrimeric transition point. When you're below that temperature, um, it, you need it to behave like a thermoset. So you want it to be stable and locked in place like a glass. And then when you heat it up, now the bonds start exchanging and flow uh, returns like it's a thermoplastic. Okay, that sounds right. So, well, my next part is like, you have, you joined the University of Akron in 2019, that was like last year. And I think it's a it's a big it's a huge achievement for a junior faculty to get such a generous award from DOE. So, do do, you, do what do you think went right uh, in terms of the application or in terms of the proposal writing? Is it the teamwork or is it like something? Is it based on the idea? What or is it a collective thing? So, do you have any answer uh, towards that? Like, so of course, it's co yeah, of course, it's collective. Yeah. Um, and I, I would say the the team is one of the most important parts of any proposal. Um, the University of Akron, we have such a strong tradition and such a huge collection of researchers that are so laser focused on these problems that we have the know-how and we have the capabilities of addressing it, these challenges um, very concisely and confidently. We know what we're doing. But then our team also consists of national labs and so Pacific Northwest National Lab, PNNL, is a vital partner because they have extensive experience with carbon fiber reinforced vitrimers, this exact area. And so they've done a lot of processing. They understand what is the most important parts of uh, performance to the DOE, um, more so than the University of Akron, which has a lot of know-how and a lot of academic research. We don't necessarily know the priorities of the DOE. And at the same time, we have industrial partners. And so um, Raytheon Technologies is a major defense contractor that is involved in our project, and they know how to do the life cycle analysis. They know where are these products going to find the most important use depending on their performance. So having a strong team is critical. We would not have received the award had it only been the University of Akron. And likewise, p and wouldn't have received it without, without us and Raytheon. So... There's a major joint effort there. 
And then, of course, you need to have the idea. Proposals at the end of the day are going to be judged on their merit and their ability to um, align with the objectives of the government's funding agencies. So you definitely need all of those components, especially in such a competitive um, you know, call for proposals. Yeah. yeah. So you, you started your career, uh, you have, after your PhD, you went to, went for a postdoc, then you went to an industrial job, I think one or two, I think. So if, if, if af, do you think anything that you learn from the industry has helped you in terms of building this proposal or in terms of coming up with this collective effort to create a proposal like, uh, like the one which you just got granted? Uh, um, absolutely. Uh, I, I'll speak to this more generally. Mm-hmm. Um, in terms of, you know, what does industry experience bring to an mm-hmm. academic career? I think it's extremely valuable. And I was only in industry for you know two years, and so I don't have decades of experience um, like some professors. Some professors work you know, 10, 20 years in industry and then make a switch over. And what it does is it really hones in where people are struggling in the industry. Mm -hmm. The literature does not always reflect what is happening in industry. And so when we are real excited about vitremers in the literature, they are exciting materials. Absolutely. Um, But there's only a handful of companies that are really looking at them. And so what I learned in industry really has a lot to do with what materials are emerging that customers are extremely excited about. And so I have focused my research on carbon dioxide-based polymers. And so we have an entire research program focused on how do we use CO2 as a feedstock? And this is a really exciting area, right? Uh, There's no better feedstock, in my opinion, for a polymer than CO2. Yeah, CO2. I agree. can be bio-based. It sounds great. But at the end of the day, CO2 is a fossil fuel material, right? It's the end of fossil fuels. So when we talk about depleting fossil fuels, we're talking about increasing the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere. So it's a great feedstock to make plastics out of. And so we have focused on what existing materials are made from CO2 and how can we improve and expand those applications. And we are also looking at What new materials can we make from CO2? And I don't think I would have looked at this problem um, in as much detail as we are had I not spent time in industry. Yeah, that sounds good. So you, so what made you to make the switch? Um, So there's a few, there's lots of things that, you know, the start line just right to, to really make the switch. So the, I could have stayed in industry for the rest of my career. It, it's, I really enjoyed it. The problems were really interesting. And I really liked the locations and my t- research team. And sometimes because of finances, those things have to change. Mm-hmm. You either need to change your team or you have to change your research project or go to a different group that's focused on applications as opposed to research. And those sort of things... Um, you know, really were discouraging uh, for me. And so I wanted to solve exciting new problems. And as I was getting redirected, I decided, let's see what else I can do with my career. So I applied to academic jobs. Um, I I had always wanted to be in academia. I really liked the culture. I really liked the, the brainstorming and the ability to look at problems that they might have applications five or 10 years out, and you really don't get to work on all of those when you're in industry. A lot of times you need to have something that's got a 12-month turnaround. Or so, yeah. And so that's really what motivated me to reapply um, to academic jobs and was fortunate enough, like you said, to um, get the offer at such a wonderful institution as the University of Akron. And so um, it, was, it was pretty easy to make the switch once the offer was out on the table. All right. That sounds good. So... When I look at your career, like you, you have, uh, you started as a pure organic chemist. If am I right? In, if I say that, yeah, I don't think anything gets more pure <laughs> organic chemistry than total synthesis. Yeah, yeah, because I was there for your job talk, so I've seen like you were showing the stereo centers and things like that, and I was like, how did, 
how does this relate to me or like you know it was really exciting to see sure. that but still i mean i am also a, tr- a chemist from by training but that was like long time ago so i don't <laughs> recognize <laughs> when you see studio centers and things like that then i believe okay this is ex- this is something i've seen before so how like so you started as a you know pure organic chemist then you switched to more of a organic organometallic chemist then what what made you to take up this plastic recycling as your challenge you could have stayed in the or you could have you could be still pursuing the pure organic chemistry that is very elegant to do as well so what made you to what inspired you to take up this plastic recycling as a challenge for your new group that you had put together at university of akron okay so there there's a lot of steps uh in that process the driving force for me to go from natural product total synthesis to looking at polymers in the first place this occurred around my fourth year in graduate school where i had spent um, you know at this point four years working towards a natural product with very little to show for it um natural product synthesis is really hard yeah we got yeah <laughs> about a step away we got one step away from our our target and then um, really just couldn't achieve the transformation for over s- six months a year really and so when that happens um, it, it becomes very challenging you're you're doing a target you need to reach a target and if you don't get that target it's not a success so that's challenging um, it's very rewarding when you do get it which we eventually did but um, when it's not working it's very discouraging so I started to question why am I making this product? And I wanted the molecules that I made to be useful or have confidence that they might someday be useful. And so the idea that, oh, I'm going to make this molecule, it's going to get screened at some point for biological activity. And if we're lucky, maybe it'll work, um, was not rewarding enough to me. So I identified polymeric materials as organic molecules that I could see how they were useful. And this is one of my favorite parts of polymers is you can design a polymer and very con- confidently predict how those properties will change. And then you can make it and actually feel it and test it. It's very hard to make a new organic molecule or a natural product and then see, ah, oh, this is going to actually cure this disease because there's so many in vivo trials and clinical trials and toxicity and complexity behind it. So... I wanted to be more closely related to the end application of the molecules I made. In my postdoc is where I first got exposed to polyolefins and it really impressed on me the what I started saying at the beginning of our discussion here is that we are not going to replace polypropylene or polyethylene. Yeah. Those are going to stay. Um, you know, if we went back 100 years and we knew everything we know about our current plastic crisis this idea of, oh, you know, there's going to be pollution everywhere. Our sea life is going to be jeopardized by these plastics. I'm confident that we would still make these same plastics. That is a really we, strong statement. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I don't think we would make anything different. It's too energy efficient. It's too, um, they're too strong and you can use less of them. They're so lightweight. We're not going to replace them with um, more dense PLA that requires more energy, right? And so I, I firmly believe that these materials are here to stay. We would just use them differently. And so now that I had the ability to make polymers, I had the impression that these materials are the most important ones to be working on. It was really easy to say, okay, this is what I want to dedicate my career to. Yeah. That sounds very, very, like a very nice story. So, th- I mean, when you are a polymer scientist, like versus you're a chemist, like when you talk to people, as I was also a chemist at some point. So people think that you're making a drug or you're making a molecule which is going to save lives. So when it comes to plastic recycling, like I think in the in the public, there's a negative notion that you're you're creating the pollution in the ocean and things like that. So what are some of the myths or like some of the concepts that drives you crazy in the field of plastic recycling? Single use is the problem, mm-hmm. not plastics. 
that is kind of our, that's my mantra right now, is that um, plastics are not the problem, single uses. So I teach an undergraduate course at the University of Akron um, called Sustainable Plastics. And one of the feedbacks I got from my students was how pleasantly surprised they were that this course wasn't reduce, reuse, recycle. It wasn't just the same thing they heard over and over again. We spent the first half of the semester talking about how plastics are used in sustainable applications. So this light weighting effort, plastics make your car lighter. Plastics allow us to transport beverages and food safely and preserves food for three to four times longer than if there is no plastic wrap. And compared to paper materials or glass materials, they weigh so much less that you can actually burn less fuel transporting them in a, in a truck, for example, right? Transporting glass bottles of Coca-Cola takes seven times as much energy as transporting a PET bottle of Coca-Cola, for example. And so we were talking about how for the first half of the semester, look, plastics are part of a solution to the environmental crisis, global warming, um, and pollution. The problem is that we use them once in silly applications. We don't respect them enough. Why do we put our yogurt in a container that's going to last for 100 years when we only use it for this makes no sense. So you were saying about the, the just about like, I was like, I got stuck on that point where you just said the energy conservation versus like using the different plastic. Can you explain a little bit more on that? Like why is that, that one plastic is better than the other in terms of like transferring, like transportation? So in terms of transportation, it's just weight. And so a, a plastic bottle um, weighs significantly less than a glass bottle. And so you can pack more plastic bottle contained beverages or foods into a truck and transport them using less fuel than a glass bottle. So it's just weight. You want to move things. It's easier to move things that are light. Simple as that. You use less material for things that are light and strong. And so it takes less material. It weighs less. Um, it generates less waste because there's just less mass. So it's really just more efficient um, with plastic materials. It's just ridiculous that they only get used once mm -hmm. and thrown away. Yeah. That's the problem. Yeah. yeah, that sounds interesting because the weight difference is very, very significant in terms of plastic and an uh, aluminum can that people would have like used in their life. Mm -hmm. So is there any advice for you? Like, you know, let's say if there's something that we are doing wrong right now, if there's any any advice that you have in terms of improving the way we do recycling, like at home, like is there any exercise that anyone who's sitting at home right now to do to make the plastic recycling more efficient? The most efficient thing and absolutely will help is to use less plastic, <laughs> especially in the single use applications. And so looking at your packaging, um, try to go packaging free for a week. That's a very challenging challenge <laughs> to... <laughs> when you say packaging free, what, what do you States. mean? I, I didn't get... So that. there are, there's pack, there's package free stores um, where there's essentially, you know, like yeah, you go yeah. to the yeah. store and you get, you get chips and your chips are in this giant, or not giant, but they're in this plastic that is multiple layers. There's seven layers in a standard chip bag, the aluminum, an adhesive layer, polyethylene for water resistance, PET. And so there's seven different plastics in that single chip bag. And the entire reason that chip bag exists is marketing. Look at us. We are this brand. Look at us. We're flashy. Oh, extra cheese. Mm -hmm. It's just advertising. And it's a huge problem. It's, it's, a product that has emerged in really only the last 30 years and is going to cause an environmental catastrophe. I don't mind getting my chips out of a dispenser, right? Like I can get my coffee beans out of a common dispenser. One of the major challenges right now is in the midst of a pandemic, um, there's huge demand 
for a single use packaging and sterile packaging. Nobody will, you can't bring your own bag to the grocery store anymore. You, no one's going to go to a packaging free store where people may have stuck their hands in with a scoop to get the coffee beans, right? No one's going, I'm not full, no way. And so um, in, in, when there's a global pandemic, that is when we should be embracing single use plastics. But as soon as this is clear and before we were in this, we should not have been using single use packaging as carelessly as we have been. Yeah, that is, yeah. So we, so you are exp like, once this is all over, you want like everyone should do what uh, James is suggesting that uh, you should use a plastic, you should take your bag to the grocery store that you want to go. That's one thing. So that you reduce the usage of the uh, the plastic bags. Plus, if you use a container instead of uh, a plastic bag for your, you know, serving coffee beans or chips, that would be also an interesting idea to to use. So one of the things I, I think people do not realize is that the plastics that you use has multiple layers on it. It's it it'll, in a, in a sense like you will feel that it's a single layer package, but in reality it has multiple. It's like he like James told that like there's a seven layer, but it can even go up to hundreds of layers, depending on the plastics that you are you are, you want to use. So that makes it very challenging for people to recycle or reuse it again. So yeah, so is there a plastic that you like? What is your favorite plastic? <laughs> <laughs> um. I, I do have a, a favorite plastic, um, and it's going to be polypropylene. I, I guessed it right. <laughs> yeah, it could have been polyethylene, right? But no, polypropylene is probably my favorite. Um, it, it's really fascinating of a material um, from a performance aspect. Um, it's really stiff uh, compared to um, other polyolefins and other plastics. It has really high melting temperatures, but it's also so versatile. Mm -hmm. And so you can you know, change the stereo, you know, we say isotactic because all of the groups are on the same side. But if you start to create errors, um, whether they're stereo errors or regio errors, you can just completely change the uh, mechanical properties. And that's entirely controlled through catalysis. And so as someone who's very interested in catalyst development and um, organometallic chemistry, that's just... That's heaven because you can make changes, you can rationally design, you seek to understand the mechanism. It's just such a fascinating material and thing to make. I used to joke when I transitioned from doing natural product synthesis where we make, you know, the joke in total synthesis is you just want to make the largest molecule with the most stereo centers. <laughs> well, I would argue the largest molecule with the most stereo centers is isotactic polypropylene. <laughs> That's such a strong argument. Yeah. <laughs> That's an argument you cannot beat, I guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Beat so, that. Is there anything like in terms of the, like, I, I, this is just out of my curiosity, like when you switch from a, you know, stereo center or like, you know, proper organic chemistry, is there a way the people from the synthetic organic chemistry look up onto the polymer people? Because I I never seen I, I I mean I wouldn't know if there's anything like that. Is there a difference? Is there a way? Is there a difference in the way people like you know visualize a polymer scientist versus a a regular chemist or a normal organic chemist? Sure, um, it will depend on the individual. Uh -huh. uh, people will respect other fields and disciplines more or less than others. And so that'll change for everyone. Um, but I can say that when I was a hardcore organic chemist, I looked at the polymer field and thought, if it has an alkene, you just make the polymer. Mm -hmm. Simple as <laughs> I didn't think there was anything more to polymer chemistry um, at the beginning of my career than alkene equals polymer. You just treat it with some catalyst and it'll work. And uh, I, I we have research projects that are trying to make that true, um, but we are very far way away from that as a field. So there are things like that. Um, the other thing I'll say is organic chemists, we work more closely with biologists and cell biologists and um, clinical trials. Our, a lot of our goals are to try to get things into the body in order to treat disease. Whereas in 
polymer science, we are much more closely related to engineers. We work with chemical engineers and mechanical engineers. And that is a different trend. That's something that's very different culturally, is how closely do you relate to engineers um, as opposed to scientists or doctors? Yeah, that I think that trend is, again, like, is happening in polymer science as well. Like, there are so many polymer people right now is trying to work with, like, for a translational type of uh, biomaterial science. So that is also, I think, is a currently a very trending subject. So, but, yeah, I, I can see that happening because you, from a polymer perspective, it doesn't really have to be a biological application. It could be a daily life or anything, any engineer or chemical engineering kind of applications. Yeah, that is very exciting and very well put, I guess. So is there anything, like, before we like stop this now before we uh, wrap up. So do you have anything on to your, anything on your not to do list? Is there anything that you do not do because you are a academician? <laughs> so I, I think about outreach a lot. Um, I, as, as when I was in high school, I, I really enjoyed theater. I did a lot of acting and performance and enjoy being humorous and silly and making jokes. And when you're in academia, you definitely have to um, tone that down a little bit. And that is something that bothers me um, when it comes to outreach. And so when I think about doing scientific outreach, I think it would be really beneficial to have a comedic spin and really make science funny and entertaining um, because it's so serious and it's so factual. And I think that that deters a lot of people from entering um, the, the STEM fields. And it, it disappoints me that I feel limited as someone in academia, that I can't have a YouTube channel where I put on a character and am really goofy and teaching you some scientific concept. So that is something that is on my do not do list. Mm -hmm. It's a, uh, a scientific caricature that I would like to use for outreach. Yeah. Interesting. I think, yeah, that that is a good idea. And we have people in University of Akron who's, who works on the outreach. So they, they do that, I think, in, in terms of uh, up, uh, reaching, doing a lot of more outreach. So is there anything, parting comments or anything that you want to add to the discussion that we had today? Because I had a blast. Like, it's, it's a, it's a, this is an outstanding interview because I have seen, see, there's a, there is a huge demand for or a huge discussion going on in the in the science or even in uh, in a uh, in a non academic environment about the plastics being the recycling or plastic recycling or polymer science so this is an exciting topic of research i always wanted to cover this in this in this podcast so do you have anything you want to tell to the listeners about uh, just before we part it's complicated <laughs> that is the takeaway <laughs> It, there's not an obvious solution. And if you think you know the absolute solution, um, you, you should probably look into it more because it's probably more complicated than that. And so mm. you know, we see these bag bands creeping around everywhere and it's like, is this the solution? And it might be, it might not be. Um, if you have to use paper bags, you're going to use a lot more energy than plastic bags and a lot more water and, eutrophy your water system because of that. And so, I mean, it's, it, you can go on and on. Mm -hmm. So it, it's, it's complicated is the takeaway. Mm -hmm. And it's do what you can, you know, try to recycle, <laughs> keep it up. Even if it ends up in the landfill, it's okay. Mm -hmm. um, just keep up the good behavior and uh, try to educate yourself on what is the best approach, the best you can. Yeah. Yeah, that sounds good. So is there any group, like this is the last one, I just missed out this point, this is something I wanted to ask. Is there any research group or resources that you would like to share with people who, who does an outstanding job in terms of explaining this recycling problem? Um, there's, a, there's a lot of content on mm -hmm. out on the internet. Um, I don't have a uh, an end-all resource for yes. this because yeah, that's there awesome. are some resources that are going to be sponsored by uh, the the oil industry. There's mm -hmm. other resources sponsored by the plastic industry, others that are environmental groups. And so um, when 
that's that's why it's and that is why it's complicated. <laughs> Yeah, that that sounds good. Like, yeah, thank you so much for your time, James. Thank, thank you so much. This is like a was a outstanding interview. So, yeah, I look I look forward to meeting again you again when the pandemic is all over. And yeah, thank you so much. Thank you for having me, Amal. Yeah, thank you. Bye. That's it for today, guys. Thank you. See you next time. If you want to learn more about the Soft Matter Show, go to the Soft Matter Show dot com. That is D H E S O F T M A T T E R S H O W dot com, or you can write to me at Amal Narayanan at thesoftmatter show dot com. Thank you, guys.